to uh, join the community uh, to commemorate 9-11, uh, a uh, day of remembrance uh, for those which, uh, a day that took thousands of American lives. And I'm uh, Dick Trendy, I'm the Chief of Police from the Hudson Police Department, and I'll be your Master of Ceremonies. Just so I know, can everybody hear me? I'll talk louder. <laughs> Well, this is as loud as it goes. <laughs> I'll speak up. Uh, thank you very much for coming this evening to the Hudson Community Nine, uh, Community-wide 9/11, a day to remember uh, for those thousands of lives that, uh, as Americans, we lost on September 11, 2001. I'm Dick Trendy. I'm the Chief of Police from the Hudson Police Department, and I'll be your Master of Ceremonies tonight. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask everyone to stand for the presentation of colors by the American Legion Post 50 and VFW Post 2115. This will be followed by the playing of our national anthem by the, by the Hudson High School Band. Thank you, Pastor Verjean. Our first speaker this evening will be Pastor Greg Heinz from the Faith Community Church in Hudson. And I'd like to uh, welcome Pastor Heinz. It is my earnest conviction, writes Gordon Seagrave, that everyone should be in jail at least once in his life and that imprisonment should be on suspicion rather than proof. It should last for four months. It should seem hopeless and preferably the prisoner should be sick half of the time. 
because only by such imprisonment does he learn what real freedom is worth. The brazen assault on our freedoms by those who would strike terror into the American psyche has become the very catalyst for a renewal of the American spirit. We're waving our flags again. It's okay to sing the old patriotic songs again, even feel the tears welling up as we do. There is a fresh appreciation for our veterans and the sacrifices they made to secure our liberties. We have a conscious awareness now that even at this moment, there are real people from real towns, just like Hudson, guarding our borders, patrolling our streets, and seeking to root out the seeds of terrorism wherever they exist around the world. We are beneficiaries of their bravery and we owe them our esteem and our prayers. <laughs> September 11th has changed our relationships. It's bringing our community together in new ways. It has wooed us from our cocoons, at least for tonight, to be together as a sign of our unity and our interdependence, as a sign of our resolve and our shared grief. We're learning the sacredness of marriage and family all over again. 29-year-old Shelley Genovesi, who lost her husband Steve in the attack, said, I used to try to rush life. I can't wait for December. I can't wait for this. I can't wait for that. But now I wish I had spent more time enjoying every moment. Steve always told me, just enjoy every day. Don't wish it away. I've lived here in New York for five years and wasted five years of my life wishing that I were back in Texas. Now all I wish is that I had my husband back and you realize how unimportant other things are. It really doesn't matter where you live, but it matters how you live. I think we're hugging more. I've seen it. I think we're expressing our love more. I think we're savoring the blessings of family and community with a little more intentionality and these are good things. But September 11th has also caused us to ask more questions and deeper questions. Questions of the spirit and the reality of evil in the world and the practical implications of God's existence. Those who laid the foundations of this nation we're well acquainted with these realities. It's why we read in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is why that same declaration ends with these words. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The beauty and harmony of creation that surrounds us tonight and the insistent conscience within each one of us testify to the existence of this creator God. And our founders recognized, or we could say even more than that, our founders insisted that the freedoms they loved more than life itself were given to human beings 
like us, not by government, not by military power, not by being classified as some elite group of intellectuals or the rich or the popular or the productive, but God. God is the one who gave us a right to those freedoms. And there is a necessary connection between the existence of God and the freedoms that we enjoy. And to, to the extent that we deny or neglect to preserve it, we jeopardize our sacred liberties. And while the founders did not agree on every point of theology any more than we do, there was a broad and deeply held consensus on this, that the acknowledgment of and submission to our Creator is necessary to the preservation of our nation's sovereignty and freedom. Our second president, John Adams, declared, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And our third president, Thomas Jefferson, asked, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God. Or our fourth president, James Madison, we have staked the whole future of American civilization, not upon the power of the government, far from it. We have staked the future of all our political institutions upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Laws, I only have 10 minutes tonight, and I'm not used to people clapping during my sermon. Laws and legislation alone cannot produce the character and selfless love that is necessary to sustain this great nation. And therefore, let us make full use of our religious freedoms to pursue this God that we may know him better and follow more closely his ways for our lives and for our country. In 1776, Thomas Paine wrote, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. And yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. And what we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything else its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. So enjoy the gift of life as brief as this life is, and seek to know God as he has revealed himself to be, so that in remembering those that we have loved and lost, we learn the lessons of freedom for this life and the life to come. Thank you, Pastor Heinz. And I'm very pleased and honored this night to have the opportunity to give a presentation of the names of members of the emergency rescue departments that are present this evening. 
Uh, I'd like to introduce each of those individuals and I'd ask that the audience hold your applause until the end. Also, when I announce each department, uh, they're asked to activate their emergency lights uh, while their department is being announced. And I also uh, apologize in advance if I butcher any names, hopefully not, but I'll try my best. Hudson Fire Department, Janelle Anaker, Lieutenant Tom Barthman, Tim Congdon, John Cody, Assistant Chief Jeff DeBruzzi, Mike Danielson, Paul Farron, Tom Forsyth, Chief Jim Fry, Butch Gary, Frank Halverson, Rich Helmgren, Paul Jensen, Lieutenant Jim Peruca, Sean Petit, Stephen Powers, Second Assistant Chief Dan Regland, Dean Rossing, Brian Schmidt, Bob Schmitz, Kim Schulte, Doug Sealander, Mark Simpson, Craig Smith, Lieutenant Dan Smith, Randy St. Ors, Jim Stilly, Captain Bill Warner, Greg Wolf, Aaron Zuli, and Tom Zuli, the Hudson Fire Department. Next would be St. Croix EMS, which is Emergency Medical Services. Janelle Anaker. Michael Bonneman. James Duffy. Dominic Eman. Alyssa Gabroy. Madeline Gagnon. Jason Gruber. Deborah Hartman, Chief Glenn Hartman, Jeffrey Kinnett, Jennifer Kerner, Corey Klebe, Ken Colby, Patty Kerba, Chris Kustrich, Hans Lampkin, Adam Laplante, Brandon Likeset, Chris Myers, Josh Olson, Jay Penfield, Gary Simachek, Craig Smith, Jennifer Smith, Timothy Sprandell, Ben Wasman, Adam Wachowski, and Chris Zacker, St. Croix EMS. <laughs> Next is North Hudson Police Department, Chief Brian Eichela, Detective Lieutenant Sean Petit, Sergeant Mark Bowles, Officer Mark Reichert, Officer Jeff Willmans, Willems, Officer Greg Dahlstrom, Detective Bob Stabell, and Susan Gornick. <clears throat> St. Croix County Sheriff's Department, Sheriff Dennis Hillstead, Captain Ron Volkert, Captain Bob Klanderman, Captain Karen Humphrey, Sergeant John Schultz, Mary Martell, Mark Michaela, Kristen Anderson, Jim Richard, Jim Dorsey, Mike Wakeling, Dave Hake, 
Carrie Rose, Kyle Magnus, Dan Braymeyer, Bob Bradford, Brandy Ewan, Jim Madela, Dean Fayweather, Mike Bondarenko, Brent Standard, Chris Drost, Neil Johnson, Ron Nelson, Tammy Doring, Dave Nestrud, Tom Vandenberg, Jim Sander, Jeff Klatt, Jim Michaela, Dave Gifford, Mike Winberg, Steve Drost, Kathy Boschwitz, Boschutz, Chris Stewart, Scott Knutson, Steve Lewis, Missy Zopp, Bob Whitaker, Dave Johnson, and Doug Hallberg. <laughs> Hudson Police Department, Chief Richard Trendy, Detective Sergeant Paul Larson, Detective Sergeant Edward Rankin, Patrol Sergeant Martin Jensen, Patrol Sergeant Robert Umke and K-9 Zeus, Liaison Officer Mark Crimmins, Officer Eric Atkinson, Officer Stephen Dunn, Officer Jonathan Grass, Officer Glenn Hartman, Officer Jeffrey Knops, Officer Bradley Kaminsky, uh, Kazmarek, Officer Jason Munich, Officer Lisa Opal, Officer Stephen Powers, Officer Timothy Rieger, Officer Peter Schultz, Officer James Van Dusen, Officer J.R. Zemek, Melanie Nazario, Jane Miller, Christine Klinger, and Valerie Nygaard. Thank you. That's the Hudson Area uh, Emergency Services that we have. I thank everybody for uh, all the officers and uh, each, all the members for attending. I would also like to make, uh, take attention to any military personnel that may be here because we certainly need them and appreciate all the uh, things that they do for us in uh, protection of our freedom. Um, at this time, uh, we need, I'd like to make a presentation of the American Legion Blue Star Banner Program. Uh, it will be presented by Gordy Knudsen and American Legion Post 50 and Hudson Mayor Jack Bro. Thank you. The Blue Star Banner service banner was designed and patented in 1917 and became the symbol of a child in the military service. During World War I and World War II, the banners were widely used across America and also during Korea and Vietnam. Following the terrorist attacks of September 11th of 2001, the American Legion rekindled the spirit of pride in our military men and women by again reemphasizing the usage of the Blue Star service banner. Today, Blue Star service banners are displayed by families who have a loved one serving in the armed forces. The banner displayed in the front window of a home shows a family's pride in their loved one serving in the military and reminds others that preserving America's freedom demands much. Earlier this evening, the American Legion Post 50 and Auxiliary Unit 50 presented several of these Blue Star service banners to families from the Hudson area. Would they please stand at this time and be recognized?
I know there are several other families in the Hudson area that have family members in the military. We would also like to present banners to those families as soon as we learn who they are. We do have a, a uh, canopy set up over here. So after the program, if you want to stop by and mention who you have in the military, we'd be glad to take that information. Please display these banners proudly in recognition of your family's service. Mayor Bro, would you come forward? <laughs> On behalf of the American Legion and Legion Auxiliary, I would like to present this Blue Star service banner to you for display in City Hall to recognize and show the city's support for all the active military personnel from the Hudson area. Please display it perhaps in the council chambers where it can be visible by the TV, TV cameras for all to see. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gordy, and we certainly will display that with a lot of pride. This commemoration should be held each September 11th throughout the land to help promote global peace and goodwill. Demonstrate Americans' resolve and preservance to win the war on terrorism. Promote responsible citizenship. Encourage patriotism and love of country. And remember the innocent victims that died on September 11th at heroes, as heroes one and all. We are really fortunate to have the service people, the police departments, the county sheriff's department, the fire department, the EMS, who are exemplary and serve so well to protect all of us. This is certainly a day to remember. And most importantly, I want to thank these young people in the band because these are the leaders who will lead the, this country in the future. So let's give them a hand. Thank you. Now on a nonpartisan approach, I'd like to read a letter from the United States Senate, Herb Cole to Lori Poppy, And again, we have to thank Lori for putting all of this together. She was certainly an admirable chairperson and look at the results she's got. Thank you. And I want to acknowledge uh, Lori at, that, at this particular time. Lori, take a bow. <laughs> to the Hudson Hospital in care of Lori Poppy. Dear friends, please accept my warm wishes to everyone attending your community observance of one year anniversary of September 11th. I regret that my schedule permits me from joining you at this special event. Over the last year, our country has changed in many ways. The tra tragic events of September 11th have affected all Americans. The healing process that has followed reminds us of what makes our country so strong. Our ability to come together, to unite as one America and demonstrate our resolve in difficult times it is what ensures our freedom. This commitment has strengthened our country in the past and will surely guide us in the future. For all the heroes and innocent civilians that have lost their lives over this past year, we must keep their memories alive and pay tribute to their service and sacrifice. As we move forward, we must stay vigilant to our commitment to combat terror and ensure justice. Your remembrance is a wonderful tribute, and my thoughts are with all of you as you remember and honor these who lost their lives in this national tragedy. Best wishes, Herb Cole, U.S. Senator. Thank you very, thank you very much. Thank you, Gordy and uh, Mayor Bro. We're now privileged to have the Commitment Quartet of the United Methodist 
Church of Hudson performing for the first time, Let Freedom Ring. This morning, our lead singer, John Krause, woke up with a throat so bad that he couldn't even talk, much less sing tonight. His wife, Jodell, called Andy Mays uh, to see if he would sit in tonight for John. Uh, Andy is a vocal music director at Hudson High School, and uh, we've, uh, we've been working on this song for a couple of weeks now, and Andy got the music this afternoon. So. Uh, Good luck, Andy. Let free. 
prisons have no key. You can be free and you can sing my freedom ring. Let freedom echo through the lonely streets where prisons have no key. You can be free and you can sing. Let freedom I was told to speak a little closer. Can you hear me? No? How's that? Okay. Paige Lewis, uh, who is a prenatal and parent educator from the Hudson Hospital and a substitute elementary teacher, will give us a brief history of the Pred Pledge of Allegiance and then lead us in reciting it. soon be sharing with you a brief history of the Pledge of Allegiance, but at this time, if there are any school-aged children out in the audience that would like to come forward on the cemented area and be prepared to lead us in the pledge shortly. While you are coming forward, let me introduce to you Jaron Waldera. Jaron is one of Hudson's youth who was selected as the 4th of July County Market Essay Contest winner entitled what freedom means to me. She will recite her essay for us at this time. Hello, um, my name is Jared. Freedom means to me enjoyment of my rights for freedom of speech, speech, security, and enjoyment of everyday life. Most of all, my freedom is valued because of the many brave people that have given their lives so each day is not filled with fear. So many others are not as fortunate to feel as safe as we do. We need to value our freedom each and every day. Thank you, Jaron. The original Pledge of Allegiance was born on September 8, 1892. Francis Bellamy, circulation manager of Rome, New York, published these words for students to recite on Columbus Day. But like anything new, it took many years to reach maturity and underwent several changes along the way. So, on October 12, 1892, more than 12 million public school children recited the original Pledge of Allegiance, beginning a required school day ritual. After the Columbus Day celebration, the Pledge to the Flag became a popular daily routine in America's public schools but gained little attention elsewhere for almost 25 years. Finally on Flag Day, June 14, 1923, the pledge received major attention from adults who gathered for the first National Flag Conference in Washington, D.C. Here their, their agenda took note of the wording in the pledge. There was concern with the, that with the number of immigrants now living in the United States, there might be some confusion when the words, my flag, were recited. In 1942, Congress officially recognized the Pledge of Allegiance, and one year later, in June of 1943, the Supreme Court ruled that school children could not be forced into reciting it. Only half of our 50 states today have laws which encourage students to recite the Pledge of Allegiance in our classrooms. In June of 1954, the last change in the amendment occurred. President Dwight D. Eisenhower approved it, adding the words, under God. In this way, we are reaffirming the transcendence of religious faith in America's heritage and future. In this way, we shall constantly strengthen those spiritual weapons which forever will be our country's most powerful resource in peace and war. 
This was the last change made to the Pledge of Allegiance. The 23 words that had been initially penned for a Columbus Day celebration now comprised a 31-word profession of loyalty and devotion to not only a flag, but to a way of life, the American ideal. Those words now read, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We are now pleased uh, to welcome our second speaker this evening, a Hudson native and uh, who is active in the community and a member and leader within our community, Mike O'Connell. Mike is also an EMT, a firefighter, and director of uh, O'Connell Funeral Home in Hudson. Thank you. September 11th affected each and every one of us in different ways. I can recall growing up watching TV, a documentary on President Kennedy and my parents stating, I'll never forget where I was and what I was doing when President Kennedy was shot. As a kid growing up, I truly didn't understand what that meant, but I have a greater appreciation of what it meant today, as I too will never forget where I was and what I was doing the morning of September 11, 2001. And as most of you, I sat glued to the TV set in awe, complete disbelief, as we watched hijacked airplanes crash into the World Trade Centers, the Pentagon, and Pennsylvania. And as we watched that morning's, our feelings evolved a little bit to that of complete helplessness and, and deep pain as we watched firefighters, EMTs, and police officers now being injured, trapped, and killed. And I can remember feelings of, of deep anger and resentment and hatred to someone that I didn't know. Because as much as the bald eagle represents our country's freedom and independence, an EMT, a firefighter, or a police officer represent our country's safety and security. And as that morning unfolded, feelings of insecurity settled in. As I mentioned, September 11th did affect each and every one of us in a different way, and my family's no different. My father used to own the Hudson Ambulance. In the 1980s, he began his tenure as the police commissioner and fire commissioner for the city of Hudson, to which this day he still holds that position. My brother Dan, as a senior in high school, became an EMT and joined the Hudson Ambulance Service and began a career in EMS. He would soon further his education by being an intensive care paramedic and director for Hudson Ambulance. For me, I'm no difference. As growing up as a child, like many of you boys out here and girls, I fantasized about becoming a firefighter for the city of Hudson. But I have to say that my drive to become a firefighter was intercepted by my brother as he convinced me to become an EMT and join Hudson Ambulance. So I did that as a senior also. I became a member of Hudson Ambulance. And I sat back and learned and watched the Petis and the Bonhamans and the Germains. And sat back and watched and learned about life and about emergency care. And how, how thrilled I was and what an experience it was. I too would further my education and become a paramedic in the Twin Cities, and I would also become one of the chiefs of, of Hudson Ambulance. <clears throat> Excuse me. As September 11th unfolded, as I mentioned, feelings of, of helplessness and hopelessness came upon us. And I want you to remember that, Dee, and I want you to recall the feelings as you watch the firefighters and the EMTs and the police now being trapped and killed. And I want you to remember that for one reason, because we don't have to go to New York to find our heroes. We have heroes right here in our community. For we have men and women right here, whether full-time for police or volunteer as EMTs or, or firefighters, that will 365 days of the year sacrifice their family events, family holidays and dinners, so that your holidays and dinners will be safe and secure. And for that, would you join me giving them a round of applause? 
Would you join me in giving them a standing ovation? I truly feel blessed of the gift I was becoming an EMT and a firefighter for the city of Hudson. I learned a great deal about life, about people, and about emergency services. And for that I would be ever grateful for. But the greatest gift I received from becoming a firefighter or EMT is the friendships that I developed over the years. And to this day, my closest friends, most of them come from the departments of the Hudson Fire Department and the Hudson Ambulance. And for you, I'm greatly appreciative for that. I'd like to end on one point. Community service, public assistance is second nature to me. And I don't think much of it. It just is unconscious for me. But I want to thank you, the public and the community, neighbors and friends, the Hudson Police Department, the Sheriff's Department, the ambulance, and the fire for what you have done for me and my family over the past seven months. We will truly be grateful and we will never forget you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Our evening soloist, soloist is Leslie Nelson. Leslie is the Community Development Assistant at the Hudson Hospital and will perform God Bless America. Father John Rasmus of the St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Hudson will deliver this evening's benediction. We have been on a journey these past 12 months. In a sense of walking through that valley of the shadow of death a journey with opportunities to love and cherish those dear to us, but also a journey fraught with temptations to hate, for revenge and retaliation. 
And that journey has brought us here tonight to this place to remember. The benediction tonight consists of two parts. The first, a prayer for that journey. And the second, that great ironic blessing, which reminds us who it is that we trust and where true peace lies. So let us pray. O Lord, support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Before we continue with our community-wide sing, Welcome Marion Furlong, President and CEO of the Hudson Hospital, to give us all a brief history of the song we'll all sing this evening, Battle Hymn of the Republic. The Battle Hymn of the Republic has supported Americans in conflict since it first appeared in the Atlantic Monthly in February 1862 during the Civil War. Julia Ward Howell, the wife of a predominant abolitionist, had visited a Union Army camp in Virginia where she heard the soldiers singing a tribute to abolitionist John Brown, who had been hanged in 1859 for leading an attempted slave insurrection at Harper's Ferry. A clergyman there at the camp, aware that Howell occasionally wrote poetry, suggested that she craft new verses more appropriate to the Civil War effort and to be set to the same wide tune. As Howell later explained, the verses came to her in a single night. She says, I went to bed and slept as usual, but awoke the next morning in the gray of the early dawn. And to my astonishment, found that, I, that, found that the wished for lines were arranging themselves in my brain. I lay quietly until the last verse had completed itself in my thoughts, and then hastily arose, saying them to myself, and wrote them down immediately. Soon afterwards, she submitted them to the poem to the Atlantic Monthly, which accepted it and paid her $4. After the verses first appeared on the first page of the February 1862 issue, they quickly caught on as the rallying anthem of the Union troops and were frequently sung throughout the rest of the Civil War. How words later inspired American soldiers during the World War II and civil rights activities during the 60s. In recent years, it has been sung at many funerals for American leaders. If you would please rise and join the Hudson High School's band and soloist Leslie Nelson in the singing of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which is in your handout. If you would also remain standing at the completion of the song for the taps to be played. Thank you. Yeah. 
To end this evening's ceremony, we'd like to take this time to thank all of you for coming to this community-wide event. As a free people, we must never forget that those innocent victims of the September 11th attack on America did not die in vain. We will conclude with a moment of silence to remember all those individuals who lost their lives and we will then have the fallen firefighter salute and taps will follow that. And now a moment of silence, please. We could have the fallen firefighter salute now.
Thank you, and God bless.